and a very pleasant good morning. Today I have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Karen Mayer. Is that correct? Mayer? Mager? Maher? Mager. Mager. Mager I, like Mager. Thank you, Dr. Karen Mager, Associate Professor in the Environmental Science and Policy and Biology Department. Now, you're listed as new faculty, but you've been around a bit. Am I correct? Um, I am Here? actually brand new faculty, but I had four years on the tenure track at a previous institution at Earlham College. Okay. So I'm coming here with a fair amount of teaching experience. Um, I thought you had. Professor. Okay. I thought you had taught prior to us doing the interview uh, last term. Nope. I'm well, brand new this fall and happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. I'm glad we got that cleared up. <laughs> well, well, let's start out with uh, the personal stuff. Tell us a little bit about you. Um, tell us about, uh, you mentioned you had some prior teaching experience uh, and sure. excellent. How did you come to where you are in education? What made you become a, uh, a professor instead of a fighter pilot? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, well, yeah, just in terms of personal information, I was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and spent my summers doing a lot of camping up in the Boundary Waters and on Lake nice. Superior, and fell in love with wilderness and boreal forests and northern environments. And that's been a huge part of the path to where I am today. Um, as a kid, just camping with family, but then later as a teenager, I spent a lot of time doing wilderness trips. Um, the summer before I went to college, I spent six weeks canoeing through the Canadian Arctic on, without any resupply. Wow. Um, and then I went on to lead those kinds of trips. So I actually led a group of young women for six weeks in the Arctic without any resupply. Um, and it, I've spent hundreds of days in the wilderness. So I think my love of the environment um, from personal experience is really what brought me to this kind of field of study. Um, once I went off to college, I was kind of fascinated with these ecosystems I was traveling through. I've always loved the Arctic. I've loved deserts. I've loved places where um, I was curious about how animals and plants could adapt to living there. And I wanted to know more about that. And that curiosity is what really brought me into being a wildlife ecologist, which is what I am today. Yes, you are. I was reading some of your vitae, and it mentions uh, you are interested in things like caribou, and you've done some field work. Tell us about that, please. That's fascinating. Sure. Yeah. So as an undergrad, I would take every opportunity I could to write papers about caribou and musk oxen and things like that. And actually, at the end of my undergrad, I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship. Um, which I received. And I spent the year after I graduated from college as a Fulbright scholar at the University of Lapland, which is in the Arctic Circle in oh. Finland. Um, and I was there to try to learn about the sustainability of reindeer husbandry under climate change. And that brought me into this kind of whole world of Arctic scholarship. Um, and following on that, a year later, I, did, I started my PhD at the University of Alaska with um, the desire to study caribou. So I've always been fascinated by caribou. I mean, people probably know what caribou are, but they're, you know, these migratory deer of the far north that can congregate in herds of like half a million and migrate 5,000 kilometers a year. And wow. um, they have, they're just stunning. They're abundant. They're super important to indigenous peoples of the north. And um, I wanted to be a part of understanding their ecology and and conserving them for future generations so that that was kind of my path nice i'm gonna to have to get a picture of a caribou because i always think of like santa's reindeer but with really big antlers am i close yes exactly yeah okay. and actually not a lot of people know this i could go i could go into a whole wormhole on this <laughs> and I won't, but um reindeer and caribou are the same species range for tyrandus they're called caribou in North America, but reindeer in Europe and Asia. And in Europe and Asia, um, a number of different cultures have domesticated reindeer. And that's where this idea of reindeer pulling a sled comes from, is that reindeer actually do pull sleds in some parts of the world. Um, I've learned something already. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're well-traveled. Is uh, that hanging behind you? Uh, 
like from Kmart or does is that that comes from someplace interesting? No, this is um, this hanging we got um, in Guatemala. Um, I yes, I am well traveled. I've always been passionate about traveling. Um, yes. When I was living in Finland on my Fulbright Fellowship um, 16 years ago, I actually met my husband, who is German, and um, we were both passionate about travel. So the two of us together just kind of amplified. So we've traveled Wonderful. to something like 30 countries together and spent hundreds of days in the wilderness and actually took an entire year off from work after I finished my PhD to travel around the world. So. Terrific. It sounds like you're bringing a tremendous portfolio of stuff to share with the students. Well, I hope so. I'm certainly curious about the world and I've tried to see a lot of it. So Great. I also noticed ethnography uh, in your vitae. Tell us a little bit about that because I was an English teacher. So I think of ethnography probably in a little bit different uh, track as you might. Right. Yeah. Well, well, I've been, I've been, as I've mentioned, I've been fascinated with the Arctic for a long time, not only how animals and plants have adapted to living there, but how people adapt to living there and the ways in which people are so dependent on wildlife, know so much about wildlife. Um, and so as part of my PhD research, I was in an interdisciplinary program called the Resilience and Adaptation Program. Mm -hmm. um, so even though my PhD is in biology, I was working in an interdisciplinary group of scholars who were social scientists and geographers and mm -hmm. um, things like that as well. And I quickly came to realize that um, obviously, I mean, I knew this before I started, but the indigenous people of the far north know a lot more about caribou than I did. And I had a lot I could learn from them that would supplement the science I was doing. Um, one thing in particular that fascinated me was that some of those domesticated reindeer from Russia were brought to Alaska in the late 1800s where there are wild caribou herds. And there were these kind of stories and rumors about how um, these domesticated reindeer had run off with the wild caribou herds and interbred, never to be seen again. Oh, wow. um, so I actually developed as part of my PhD, um, an oral history project where I worked with a whole bunch of um, Inupiat elders from Northern Alaska mm -hmm. to document their stories and memories of herding reindeer in the 1920s, 30s and 40s and what had happened when they encountered these caribou herds and how they'd lost these domestic reindeer to joining caribou. I combined that with a bunch of historical and archival research, but also spent a lot of time um, just in people's houses while they were butchering caribou or eating caribou, <laughs> spent time camping out on the Arctic coast with an Inupiat family as part of a culture camp. And just seeing how people talked about the animals um, was really important. To my understanding of them. So oh. I, I, I really firmly believe that it's, it's essential if you're studying wildlife to know um, as much as you can about them. And that includes people outside the sciences. Yes, because we're all we're kind of in this together. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay, let's look at, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, let's look at how you got to SOU, what, mm -hmm. how, you know, from the Arctic Circle and to uh, SOU, kind of a commute, but we're glad you're here. How'd that happen? Right. I mean, I think the path to SOU came about because I love teaching and I really wanted to be at a place that values teaching and where that was a big part of what I could contribute to the world. Um, I uh, took some opportunities to teach during my PhD and um, I've always taught in kind of a wilderness leadership context. Mm -hmm. um, so after my PhD, I was hired on as a professor at Earlham College, a small liberal arts college in the Midwest and gained a bunch of teaching experience there and had a wonderful time. Um, but there's always been this kind of tug and pull between uh, the comfort zone of the Midwest where I was born and raised and places that have a lot of wilderness and exciting natural resources like Alaska. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited to see the opportunity to come to SOU pop up because um, I knew it was a place that would allow me to teach in environments that were a little bit more varied with a lot of wilderness and natural resources. 
And the more and more I learned about our environmental science and policy program here, I was super impressed with the approach that it takes to really training students um, in environmental fields. And so it just seemed like the perfect fit. And uh, I'm really happy that I was offered the job and have the opportunity to be here. Now, do you think, as you mentioned a lot of outdoor experience, are you going to be able to include some field work, some outdoor time with your curriculum here, or is that just going to be a personal interest and you maybe you can push the, or encourage the students to go in that direction? Oh, I hope to do some. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly, you know, um, I'm almost all of the classes that I'll be teaching here are lab classes. And once this pandemic is over and I can be in person with my students, I definitely intend to spend some of those labs outside with them doing hands-on activities. Um, in terms of longer field courses and things like that, maybe eventually, um, my life has changed some since those wilderness days. I have a three-year-old daughter and I am actually pregnant with twins right now. Um, well, you, you have a full plate then. Yeah. So it's a little harder for me to just take off with my students for a week to go explore yes. the desert, yes, but yes. maybe one day again, I'll do things like that. Well, super. Tell me if I come into your class, uh, not me as you know, senior bill, but uh, here I am a 18, 19 year old person coming into your class. Uh, I know nothing about this. How, what tactics or strategies can you use in the classroom to kind of pull me in? And let's piggyback on that. You mentioned the pandemic. That is a big issue, especially for a lab class. Uh, do you have anything that uh, you found might be helpful or any ideas you'd like to try? Yeah. Those are great questions, um, yes. Um, so I think if you're a student walking into my class on the first day, my, my first focus is I want you to feel like you belong. That's really become a huge part of my teaching philosophy in the last couple of years. I want a student to walk into my class and feel like they have a place there, regardless of where they've come from, what their background is, um, because Learning is all about pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and recognizing that there's things that you don't know and being okay with that and being humble about that and then building up the knowledge and confidence to do that. And one of the challenges I think, especially in like a science classroom is that um, we have a lot of stereotypes in our society of who a scientist is. Uh, and a lot of students feel intimidated by that. And I want students, regardless of their background, to feel like I belong in a science classroom and I'm able to face the challenges of, of learning something new. So I really focus on trying to set like a really encouraging collaborative tone on mm -hmm. the first day that's often more about um, how we're gonna learn together and why everyone is welcome. Um, and then I also try to inspire people, right, which I don't think is hard in an environmental science context, like we're in a world where environmental problems exist everywhere, and they're not going away, and we need so many people to do that work. And so I think it's pretty easy to demonstrate to students that there's value in what they're going to learn in environmental science class. Exactly. It also sounds like if I'm a member of an underrepresented group or a first group going to college uh, family, I'd, I'd find a nice welcome in your class. Yeah, I've really, um, you know, it's always something I've cared about, but I think just caring about in being inclusive isn't always enough. And I've been really benefited a lot from training I've received. And it's something I'm super grateful to Earlham College for my time there, um, because they did really a good job of offering opportunities for training and inclusive teaching. And um, so I've been able to develop a lot of different practices that I, I think help with that. Um, I mean, just as simple as telling students on the first day that I think they're capable of succeeding um, is part of it. Um, I like to go through, I love to talk students through the learning cycle um, and point out that at the beginning of learning, there's, there's things that you don't know and you're not even aware that you don't know them. And the process of becoming aware of all that you don't know can feel intimidating, um, but it's important to recognize that that's a part of learning. So that's something I do. Um, but then specifically to help make more underrepresented groups um, understand that they're welcome and should be represented in the classroom. I've started doing a lot more with making sure that my 
assignments and readings really highlight the backgrounds and personal stories of, of some of the um, scientists whose work we're studying. So like this term in my mammalogy class, um, I've been assigning papers alongside a biography of the author um, following the method um, called the Scientist Spotlight Initiative that was initiated by some folks in California. Um, and students write a reflection where they can reflect not only on the paper they're reading, but also um, what they've learned about who does science from reading the biographies. And then the, in addition to that, the students are actually going out and they're, they're doing some reviews of scientific work by some of these memologists, but they're actually collecting biographical information about them too, um, focusing on scientists from underrepresented groups and will be um, posting that online as part of the class. That sounds so interesting. Bring oh, it in goodness. a little more explicitly too. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, we touched on it briefly. How are you doing with the uh, teaching on Zoom basically? The, I, I can tell you it would drive me nuts because mm -hmm. I'm used to being out and talking to persons face to face and having interactions and picking up the vibe in the room and things like that. Yeah. How is it uh, working with you? It's a challenge. Um, I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. So I appreciate that. But it is a challenge because I like to be walking around the classroom. I like to chat with my students and get to know them. Um, I do a lot of like collaborative active learning in the classroom normally. And so translating that to a Zoom environment is hard. Yes. I mean, I've been, you know, I think the synchronous classes are, are working well, been doing um, breakout group activities and um, with varying levels of success, but I'm always happy when students seem really engaged and like they've really talked to one another and thought something through. So yeah, that's one of the things that I'm doing. I think um, the big challenge is labs. I mean, I'm teaching two courses right now that are lab courses where one of them is computer-based and I'd normally be just like running around the classroom peering over people's shoulders the whole time. So mm -hmm. translating that to a Zoom environment is like um, one of those challenges in super specific communication, right? Because they're doing something on their computer that I can't necessarily see and I have to help them through the problem. Um, and then my other class, Mimology, normally has a field lab where we'd be out, you know, capturing small rodents and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So translating that has taken a lot of work. And I think um, I'm excited about one of the solutions we've come up with for that, which is uh, a partnership with North Mountain Park here in town to put wildlife cameras up all over the park. Oh, nice. And we're actually um, going to be, we're, well, we're currently collecting data, photographs of different wildlife, and then students have formed groups to design projects um, to look at things like the times of day that different mammals are active and the different habitat types that they're using. And so Next week, we're going to be collecting all of those images and seeing what we found. So that's one way to still kind of do something field work ish, even though everyone's in their own. Separate. Everybody's in, in, yeah, in their living room or the den or whatever. Yeah, I think the hardest thing about Zoom for me is I just I like to really get to know my students and it's harder to do that over Zoom. It is. Um, I've been. I've noticed that when I do more small group activities where students need to ask for help, those are the chances where I get an opportunity to really talk to my students a little more. And so that's been one of the kind of side benefits of, of those. I have noticed office hours on Zoom can be a lot more productive because they can be flexible. Uh, you don't have to drive into campus and uh, sit there from two to three and meet with the person. Uh, now you can, like I'm chatting with you at 10, I'm going to see somebody else at three and I'm going to do a load of laundry in between. So it's practical. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's very practical. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's interesting how it does kind of, um, it does kind of, well, there's no way to avoid like the rest of life and the rest of life is always going to influence what a student does in the classroom, right? But now it's just so much more obvious and it's obvious to us as faculty too. I mean, I'm working hard, but it, it's helpful being pregnant with twins to be teaching from home. Like I can go get a snack every hour or two, which I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember my wife and her Hagen Das days. <laughs> Just a half gallon till dinner. And 
Yeah. You like the chocolate chip? We got it. No problem. <laughs> Yeah. We, okay. We started talking a little bit. You went into the uh, changes in the world. Uh, I'm always curious when you get like a climate denier mentality mm -hmm. in a class, or there are people who say, no, this is just a weather cycle. And I live in talent. Do you live in talent as well? I live in Ashland, actually. Oh, okay. I live in talent and uh, I'm 900 feet from the fire line. Oh, yeah. I think we do have some serious burn issues going on. And without getting into all of the politics, from an educational perspective, how can you help reach someone who's at the age of 19, brain has calcified into one school of thought? Like someone actually said, the jury's still out on evolution. And my comment was, what jury, where? We did it in scopes in 24, 25 come on people as an educator that has to be difficult yeah and I think um well in some sense I've, I've had plenty of students who were misinformed or unsure about topics like climate change I've never had a student who's um really obviously a climate denialist although I have to say, I'm sure it's intimidating for those students in an environmental science classroom to raise their voice because they're definitely in the minority. So it's possible I've had those students who I haven't been quite as aware of. Um, but still, I think, I mean, I think first and foremost, one of the best things that we can do for issues with um, climate denial or evolution is to just show how the science works. Right. I really want to show students how the process of science works, how we gather evidence, how we look at and think critically about that evidence um, and how evidence can be represented in a lot of different ways. Right. And so how to really think critically about, um, for example, I did this with an activity with my students earlier this term. We talked about how to create good graphs and figures and we contrasted some of the graphs and figures put out by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and some graphs and pig figures that have been put out by climate denial organizations and looked at the ways that you could kind of manipulate, manipulate the, the time spread of the graphs and the way that the data appears um, to communicate different things. And so um, that kind of critical thinking um, is something that all students should know, you know, re regardless of their beliefs, um, thinking critically about how it is represented. Um, but then also understanding the scientific process well enough to see like, it's, this isn't just some like black box that experts are in doing their thing. Yes, there's lots of specialized knowledge. We need to understand science, but anyone can use the scientific method and come to a conclusion and like walking students through that and having them understand that um, kind of demystifies science and makes it more democratic mm -hmm. and less of something that people over there we don't trust do, I think, mm -hmm. hopefully. So... Yeah, and I'm always curious when scientists became untrustworthy because I remember this guy in a white lab coat with a tube of Crest toothpaste back before your parents were born. Crest mm -hmm. has been shown to be an effective decay preventive dentifrice, and I, I still use Crest today, uh -huh. like 700 years later. <laughs> uh, when did scientists fall into disrepute? I I miss that meeting. No, well, I mean I think it's complicated. Um, I tend to think of it in a couple ways. I mean, especially in the environmental world, scientists are often kind of speaking truth to power. Like some of the things that scientists find are pretty inconvenient <laughs> for, um, for the way that our world works, right? Because they suggest, um, you know, we shouldn't be using resources that people want to use uh, in a certain way. Um, we should be completely shifting these systems of fossil fuel consumption that benefit people who have a lot of power and money and want it to continue that way. So there's that aspect of science, I think. But um, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot during the coronavirus. You know, there, there, there are some there are some legitimate reasons to be frustrated with the historical arc of science too, right? Like science has not always been conducted ethically, and you know, the reasons that, um, for example. There, I've seen some of the sur surveys that have been done that suggest um, in the United States, people of color are more hesitant to take a coronavirus vaccine um, in many cases. And that comes from a history of being um, 
treated unethically in medical research or experimented upon or things like that. And so I think it's important to like, I'm a huge champion of science, but I think it's really important to understand that there are reasons why people are skeptical of science um, from a lot of different perspectives and to just try to do better <laughs> as scientists. <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> and how we do what we do and how we communicate it, yeah. Well, the big question we always like to ask everybody, you're new here, welcome. In the next five years, what is your vision? What would you like to see happen within your department? Not, well, not only within your classes, but directions that perhaps the department could take. And be careful, you'll end up on a committee someplace if, oh, <laughs> if it's too good of an idea. Yeah, that's the big question. Well, I am just thrilled to be part of the environmental and science and policy program because I think that we have um, a really strong program already, and we have a lot of opportunity to serve students in new and different ways um, in the program. So um, I think that one of the things that we do well is really connecting students with the local environment and with community organizations through applied projects in almost all of our classes and um, internships and research opportunities that give students a lot of hands-on skills. Um, so being new here, of course, part of my five-year plan is to try to get to know all those community organizations and landscapes and build partnerships myself so that I can be a part of helping to connect students to research opportunities in you know, wildlife monitoring or ecological restoration or things like that where they really get to apply what they learn um, with community organizations and with me as a researcher. So yeah, developing those partnerships is a big part of my five-year goal. Um, Outstanding. Yeah. Anything else? Because I, I think we pretty well uh, went through our list of questions. Is there anything I may have freight trained through that you wanted to elaborate on or any other final thoughts you'd like mm -hmm. to share? Let's see. I don't know. Yeah, just just talking more about goals. I think that, um, yeah, I think environmental science and policy, um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about which students we're drawing and we're we're already drawing uh, students to our program who are a little bit more diverse than SOU students on average and a bit more of a national scope. I think we really have the opportunity to be a national leader in environmental science and policy. And I'm just excited to be to be a part of making that happen. Well, thank you. Uh, we are lucky to have you here. I mean, Fulbright Scholar, uh, Caribou Whisperer, uh, Mother and Mother-to-be, uh, World Traveler. Thank you for coming in today. And uh, if there's anything we can do for you as far as that pesky teaching online at uh, Cattle, give us a call. Uh, or we'll zoom. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Kettle. I actually utilized your workshops a ton over the summer. I knew nice. I was emailing Hart long before I was on contract. So I really appreciate all the work that you're doing. It's been oh, very thank helpful. Thank you kindly. Have a lovely day. Stay safe. And we'll look forward to hopefully eventually seeing you on campus. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you, Bill. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.